benefits and, and mm -hmm. retirement benefits, sick leave and vacation, this place that is. Okay. All right, we are on air. It is uh, 30 seconds till 5.30, but let's just roll into it anyway. Oh, there's Misty. <coughs> There is a an extra chair behind you. We can. Yeah, there's a chair here. Yeah. Oh, is there a spare one over there? Oh, uh, she's got one right there. Sorry, folks. Shouldn't be talking about chairs while we're on air. But that's okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, welcome everybody to uh, the August 9 business meeting of the MSAD 15 School Board. Appreciate everybody coming out on a beautiful summer day when I'm sure we'd all rather be doing something else than sitting inside. Um, let's uh, declare a quorum. We have all 10 of our uh, current school board members here. Uh, for people who don't know, our 11th school board member, uh, Laura Sturgis, has resigned. And so uh, the town of Gloucester is in the middle of appointing a replacement for her. Uh, so let's start the meeting with our Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right, uh, upcoming meetings. Uh, our next business meeting will be September 6th. Uh, it'll be at the New Gloucester Meeting House at 6.30 p.m. Uh, right before that meeting, there'll be a facilities committee meeting as well at 5.30 p.m. Uh, let's see, Craig, I think you wanted um, an adjustment to the agenda. Is yep. that right? Yeah. Um, so let's see. Can I hear a motion to adjust the agenda to add a, an agenda item uh, to consider Kathleen True for a first probationary teacher contract as a social worker? So moved. Well, it's on there, I guess. Maggie, beat me to it. Well. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was a late minute ad. So right, it wasn't on the last copy that we saw right. as a board, so I think it's probably appropriate okay. that uh, we add it. So Second. move that for me. Second. Jason Thank you. Uh, any objections to that? All right. All in favor? Thank you. Okay. Uh, do we have any, uh, any other additions or adjustments that people want to make? Nope. Okay. Uh, any comments from the audience? Mrs. Sturgis, you're just here to hang out. Uh, Hi. <laughs> Um, seeing none, I will move on to old business. Can I hear a motion on the minutes from the July 19 meeting? I move that we accept as printed the minutes of the July 19, 2023 regular business meeting. First. Second. All right. <laughs> uh, anything that somebody found on the minutes? All right. All in favor? Thank you. Okay, uh, let's move into new business. Uh, can I hear a motion on Melissa Ellie? I move we consider Melissa Ellie to a first probationary contract, seventh grade ELA social study teacher for the middle school. Second. All right, uh, is uh, she here for introduction? Yes, she is. All right. Miss Ellie, come on up. It's Eli. I was about to say, I was asking, I'm sorry, I should have asked before I said that out loud. Eli, my apologies. So I'd like to introduce uh, Melissa Vila as our new uh, middle school uh, social studies English language arts teacher. She has a, 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 a long career. Uh, she has been uh, a middle school teacher at um, the uh, Turner School System, which I believe is SAD 52. Mm -hmm. And she has a, a master's degree in secondary education. She's done a lot of work uh, with integrated instruction, which is taking common themes in English and social studies and science and art and interweaving them together. Uh, she's done a lot of work around curricular standards as a team leader and teacher leader uh, at her school district. And um, she has wonderful references. 
and uh, she gave a really good interview, and uh, we had a really long uh, conversation about the strategic plan at the middle school, and I was very impressed with her insight. So I wholeheartedly uh, uh, recommend Miss Eli. Great, thanks, Craig. Thank you for that introduction. Any uh, thoughts or questions on the motion? I'm sorry, I didn't hear what district she came from. Turner, MSAD 52. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, seeing none, all in favor? Get her hired. All right, thanks a lot. Well, welcome to the district, Melissa. Appreciate being here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, can I hear a motion on Kathleen True? I move to reconsider Kathleen True to a first probationary contract as a social worker at the middle school. Second. All right, uh, Kathleen is here. No, she right. accepted the, the job at uh, 2.30 this afternoon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, anyhow, uh, yes, uh, Kathleen True is uh, uh, a main uh, licensed clinical social worker. Uh, she's had that license uh, for several years. She did her uh, master's degree at the University of New England and her undergraduate degree at the University of Southern Maine. She has worked extensively with the Morrison Center, which serves uh, students with special needs, and she's actually worked with some of our students, and she's worked with some of our staff. So um, she uh, is uh, well uh, versed in the work we do and, and how we do it. Uh, she's also uh, did a clinical license for, through the Oceanside Community School, which again is a, a special uh, needs uh, school. Uh, I spoke to her at length about our Gateway program, which is a therapeutic program. So uh, it focuses on students uh, who need to work on conflict resolution, de-escalating behaviors. Um, and uh, I was pretty impressed with her, and she's done a lot of work with that. Not only has she done a lot of work with that, um, she's done a lot of work in uh, teaching and professional development with other teachers that need, uh, that have to work with students that might have behavioral problems or therapeutic problems that um, happen uh, in the classroom. So uh, I think we're getting a true professional, um, well-trained and uh, well-versed in uh, middle school students. Great. Any thoughts or questions? All right, seeing none, all in favor? All right, great. Well, uh, welcome to the district, Kathleen, wherever you are in the world. Appreciate uh, you joining us. Okay, let's move into uh, this application for the grant from the Maine Department of Education Revolving Renovation Fund. Uh, why don't we do this as a motion, and then we'll hear from Craig in discussion and then make our decision. Does that make sense? All right. I move we grant permission to the administration to apply for a grant with the new Department of Education Revolving Renovation Fund in conjunction with the Council of Services. Second. Thank you. Um, there's been some documentation in your emails on this, but for the camera, Craig, uh, do you want to kind of summarize why uh, administration is asking for this permission? Sure. The um Maine Department of Education Revolving Renovation Fund is a fund that is put aside. It's been in existence as long as I have been uh, a superintendent and a principal. And what that money is, is the state of Maine Department of Education legislature recognize that uh, we have older schools. We have uh, schools age, schools need to be updated, uh, just like owning a house. So they have a revolving renovation fund where school districts can apply and they have priorities. This year, the priority that they're funding uh, is air quality. They're also a priority for heating and uh, heating mitigation, meaning the heating system's great, but you're seeping, you know, your windows are wide open, you know, how do you fix things that are causing you to lose your heat? Um, so they're, the number one priority this year is uh, air quality. Um, the state has recognized an even bigger need uh, for uh, this fund 
And for this year alone, uh, normally projects in the past have been $1 million per project. Uh, this year, they have put $2 million per project. So it's, it's, it's a big boost. Um, and so uh, we can apply for those funds for revolving renovation. And what we're proposing is, is to work uh, with uh, Mechanical Services. And Mechanical Services is a company that's worked with the school district before. Uh, as a matter of fact, we hired them uh, during the pandemic to do some auditing of our, of our buildings and to do some preliminary investigative work for uh, the school bond project. They also did the HVAC work, right? They did yeah. the HVAC work. So our, our, our COVID relief funds uh, a couple of years ago, they uh, worked with us and Honeywell to put in a new ventilation system in the east wing of the high school. And so they work with Maine Department of Education grants all the time. Um, they do a lot of school constructions. They do a lot of school renovations. They would like to partner with us um, and continue to do investigative work. Uh, they've already tested some of our classrooms for air. They already have some preliminary data for air from the work that they did with us previously. Uh, they would do more thorough investigation of our air quality. Uh, and then based on that research, um, if we have one building, two buildings, three buildings, four buildings, that are really in need of better air ventilation or better air systems, they would write the grant proposal with us and they would put in why we need the air system, what is the data that backs up the air system, um, and then um, they would submit the grant. If we get the grant, by the way, the, the work that, the work, this work is kind of already paid for. It's part of the auditing that we paid for with our COVID relief funds when they did the original. So if they continue, if, if you approve tonight and they continue to test all five buildings, th there isn't a bill for that. It's already been bought and paid for from your previous work. And so um, the timeline, and that's why you're seeing it tonight, um, application process has begun. The deadline to apply is September, October 31. And so that's a quick turnaround. So mechanical services, if we agree and the school board uh, gives us permission to proceed, they will help us to ensure that that application with all the I's dotted and T's crossed is submitted by October 31. And then there's a panel that reviews uh, in Augusta and they make their final decisions about whether or not a project is funded. If they decide a project is funded, then we have to return to you to say they have recommended a project at, let's say, Memorial and the state has approved this. Um, then we come back to you and say, do you want to proceed with this project? So you're not committing to anything by submitting the application. However, if you do have a school or schools approved for this renovation fund, we have to come back to you and explain what the terms are. And, um, and well, there's also always a local contribution. There's a local contribution. I'm, I'm going to get to that in, in a minute, but. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so there's, um, so you would have to approve of any project going forward. The terms, there are terms um, on how this is paid back. And again, those have been adjusted for this year um, because of the difference uh, in money. Ah. So the fund provides loans to the school districts to finance project expenditures. A portion of each loan is considered a grant and is forgiven. The forgiveness rate ranges from 30% to 70% and is based on a percentage of the SAD 
uh, state subsidy. So it's linked directly to your ED 279. So that means we're going to get like 45 percent. Yeah. So we would probably uh, we would probably get hopefully around the 40 percent, 45 percent forgiveness rate. And then the remainder of balance is paid back uh, in either five or ten years at zero percent interest. The loan repayment uh, revolved back into the SRF, uh, and uh, that's SRF is the revolving fund, and are then used to fund other approved projects. The maximum loan that can be provided is capped at two million per priority per school building within a five year period. So to reiterate, the forgiveness is 30 to 70 percent. Uh, then the rest is financed at either five or 10 years at zero percent, and you could have $2 million per project. So we would not send in, so we can send in an application for all five schools all at once. But that's not how they award. They will look at each so let's say we apply for all five schools. They look at each school individually. So you might have one or two schools approved. You might have three schools approved. You might have no schools approved. But each one is an individual approval. And, um, and then you have to determine which one um, you would want funded that's approved by, by uh, Augusta. And the closing part is that we would have to get approval from the voters to accept this money because really we are taking on a spending obligation. It, it's essentially kind of like a bond. Right. We went through this process. We want this money. Uh, if we get this money, some of it's paid back and the rest as a, as a school district, we're going to pay it back on these terms and so they would have to the the uh, voters in June would have to vote on this just like they would any other uh, uh, bond project okay so first uh, questions clarifying nature uh, let's start at the back Cole uh, the first question is looking at the um, things you listed in here as far as the uh, air quality mm -hmm. You've got the high school listed 10 rooms, middle school four, done eight, Russell three, and Morrow don't have any data yet. But we just yeah. went through this with COVID, right? Yeah. So why why do we have these numbers if we just went through this with COVID but everything was fine after we did the HVAC project? Why, did, why is this popping back up again? Well, I don't know that it's popping up again. So what they mm -hmm. did was they put uh, sensors throughout all the buildings uh, to test air quality. And those were uh, the ones that popped up. And it doesn't necessarily mean that that's ongoing constantly. And, it, and, and so what further research would do is determine, is this a problem in this room constantly? Or is it temporary? Is it sliding in and out? Um, and so they would have to do further research. And they would te test in depth. Um, not just for carbon levels, but other things that they would determine. Um, so it's also because the state passed a new law saying that we have to meet new air quality standards as of 2026. Um, and so before, there was no state statute on carbon dioxide levels, and now there are. Um, so this is, a, at some point, there will be testing of the carbon dioxide levels in our buildings. So we're trying to get out ahead of that and, you know, use this, you know, sort of goosed up revolving funds to get money for it before someone comes in and says, hey, I tested five rooms and they failed the carbon dioxide levels. You need to deal with it right now. So the, in the high school project, um, the genesis of that was we had this largesse from the federal government and COVID relief funds, and we wanted to do projects that were big ticket projects that wasn't going to use local tax dollars. So that wing of the high school was the only wing that did not have 
uh, direct ventilation from the outside. So what that project did for you was now every single classroom in that school has uh, fresh air blown directly into each classroom. So it's a little bit of a different reasons for uh, what the project, uh, why we did the project. So we can probably assume these 10 rooms at the high school are from the opposite wing? We would hope so. We would hope okay. so. That, that's kind of what I'm getting at. Yeah. Right. yeah. And the only other question I have is, uh, you said they're going to do the bulk of the grant writing, I'm assuming? Yeah, they, they make their living uh, by doing uh, uh, federal and, and state grants. And uh, so if it's hospitals or schools or other big agencies where the, the federal or state government creates these big um, grants that schools can apply for, you know, most school districts in Maine, they're small shops. They don't have the capacity to write these complicated grants. So it's, it's kind of their specialty to partner with school districts um, on how to complete these grants. So but, who would be our representative working on that with them from the district? Uh, a lot of buildings and ground staff, uh, Tom Bullen, Jeff, uh, me, building principals. Yeah. But they also, just because they help us with the grant writing, uh, we'd still put the project out to bid. They would still have to win the bid in an RFP situation, just like anyone. I think they're confident because of their experience that they would win the bid, but there's no, I made it very clear in the facilities meeting where they presented this that, you know, we're going to have to follow the book and if they don't win the bid, they don't win the bid. That's not our problem. So in my view, you know, we've, we've talked about bond projects, we talk about maintaining our buildings, we talk about um, making sure that we have a safe environment for schools. Um, and we know that some of our buildings are older. Memorial was built in, in the 1950s. Uh, Russell, I'd imagine, about the same time. So as these buildings get 70, 60, 70, 80, 90 years older, um, they're going to need these kinds of infrastructure work. And um, I think it behooves us to look at it really closely because these are really, really good terms. Uh, you know, if, if eight years down the, row, down the road we have a serious problem, state law says we have to fix it immediately, and then we end up getting stuck paying for it with all local okay. dollars, um, that's problematic. And as far as I'm concerned, you know, if we don't at least research to find out which schools would qualify, um, there's a school district down the road that's going to take that money. And, and so I think it behooves us just to pursue the grant application process, if not for at least to see what the condition of air quality is in all our schools. And if a number of them do have serious problems, we have a good way of dealing with it now uh, under good terms. Uh, there was, do you guys satisfied with the questions or well, go ahead, you, you, an, you answered part of it. I was wondering about the bid process following it, whether or not, since they conduct a study and help us with the grant if we're already committed, but you, you already answered that question. The only other thing I, I, that occurs to me is that what we kind of, if we're going to commit to the study, I think we have to commit to the grant proposal application because once we have the study done if we identify problems where I feel like we're obligated to fix them we can't any longer say we don't know so um, if we're going to do the study that may very well raise some flags I think we need to be prepared to find the funding. right and that's why we went all the way to apply for a grant not just do the study right and I just think yeah. but since the study hasn't been done that's leading to the grant application I feel like if we're going to say push the button on the study, then we have to push the button on the application also. Yep. I don't think I think it'd be irresponsible not to. Well that so, so I, I agree with that too. Um, but in addition to that, I, it goes along with Cole's question. Um, ultimately this grant is they may be helping us write it, but it's originating from the district. Who at the district is we may not have that, but I assume we're going to you know, appoint someone who's going to take responsibility and sign off on, on that grant uh, from the district, make sure that everything is 
um, correct for our district to kind of do a full review of it. Um, do we have someone already in place for that, or is that to be determined? Yeah, your superintendent. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the good news and the bad news is it's the superintendent. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Question. Um, is the solution usually when there is a carbon dioxide problem, HVAC renovation? Um, or other I don't know. I'm not technically, I, w I would assume. Um, you know, when we were at the height of COVID and a lot of schools didn't have good ventilation, um, the guidance was, yeah, crack a window f for half an inch and that was enough to do the trick for. But um, I can't answer technically if HVAC is the solution. Um, it could just be, I. <clears throat> know just enough about this to be dangerous because uh, maybe Matt has done some stuff. It could just be putting in carbon dioxide detectors and if they have a certain reading that you open the window or you know there's things like that that I, you know I've seen put in place. That doesn't necessarily always involve you know a big giant thing. Do we have any data on current areas that have been tested for carbon dioxide? Yes they yeah. did um, uh, I listed uh, in, in the little email, yeah, so those schools in their spot testing of all the rooms in all the schools, um, those rooms came up at certain times of the day at certain frequency and that's why they're on that list. Um, Go ahead, Pat. Okay, um, first question is um, how much has been invested so far in this project? In this project? that you've done so far? So, uh, none. The work that's been done to date is none because we had hired them um, to do the HVAC job at, uh, during the pandemic and they did some research then and that's how it was determined that if we went with the high school project um, for air ventilation, um, that's how we would use our COVID relief funds. So the work that they've done, to na done now for the spot checking and testing in all these rooms has been paid previously with the COVID relief grant that we hired them for the high school ventilation. So they examined all the other buildings um, with the same dollars that they used to fix the high school. Is that what you're saying? No, what I'm oh, saying is- they saying not, yes. <laughs> no, I, I mean, that's my impression is that as part of their services, right, since we had already done this services, they came to us in a facilities committee and they said, this is a service that you've paid for as you are getting this HVAC renovation, we will go out and test all of your buildings. Do you want us to do that? And we said, sure. And they concluded that there was some radon as well as? I, they didn't say radon. I. I I'm assuming they look, they did, but uh, because it's so commonplace in Maine. But I can't the, find that email, so. Uh, yeah, but um, I, I'm sorry, I can't answer, but they I didn't say anything about radon. Right? Yeah, they're definitely tested the, 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 it's just the carbon dioxide. yeah, the impetus is the carbon dioxide uh, for the air quality. And then you mentioned that um, eight or 10 years down the road, we might have a problem. So um, if we don't do this project and then we would have to pay the full price for it, it's basically what you're saying. They may be a problem. And um, are you also saying then that if they do the project and there is a guaranteed, I mean, how long would that work be guaranteed for? We are full of gas down here in this town. I mean, we all know that. I'm, I remember Russell School and all the panic we all parents had because there was stuff coming up from under mm -hmm. the ground, and it does every day mm -hmm. in this town because of our structure. But anyway, so, um, you know, it's gonna be a, one day it'd be clear and other days it won't be. You know, it, it's a moving target is what I'm trying to say. So, when you're dealing with this, so, I'm um, thinking is this something that we really need to be looking for. I think you guys were alluding to it a little earlier. Uh, is this something that we really need to look into or is it just 
Um, if we're satisfied now with the way the quality is and everything, what's to say it isn't going to be the same quality, you know, for the next few years? And you know, it's really it's really about the new air quality standards that got passed in state law. So we really have never tested for carbon dioxide before because there was never a quality standard that we had to meet, and now there is. So the first part of this is them saying, in these spot checks, it looks like you would have failed that air quality standard. And so now what we would be doing is authorizing them to go acquire you know, more thorough testing data, which would then inform what sort of mediation we would need to do. I think what the legislature did um, through the Maine Department of Education is, we passed this law now that has changed the carbon dioxide level standards as an incentive to help you meet that requirement we are doubling the amount of money in the revolving renovation fund so here's your opportunity to fix any problems that have you out of compliance with the new air quality standards and so um, I think that's where we are. Where we are 10 years down the road with any requirements or changes in regulations um, that affect our building, I, I, I don't know. But I, I do know that when our buildings are, are 75 and 80 years old, um, there's going to be something. Something that's going to need a roof, it's going to need a driveway, it's going to need windows, it's going to need something. Um, and so, uh, my recommendation here is um, I'm assuming that all, many, if not all school districts that have um, ability to apply for this will because um, they want to meet the standard. Right. Um, in, in your notification, uh, the listing that you gave us, uh, it said the approval was June 24, 23. I think you might, might have meant 24. Yes. Do you think that was a typo? I'm sure it was a typo. Okay. Second thing is that it also mentions something about um, uh, green approach. Mm -hmm. Is this all in disguise of going green? Um, you know, when I used that way, word, I thought... You know, I don't know was, if that's the right word, but I'm, I'm going to say... No, it is the word I used. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, green is in the sense, you know, fresher air, cleaner air. I don't think there's anything wrong with going green. It's yeah. the way of the future, and if you put in the right systems, then yeah. it takes care of it. And, but I also, it sounds like regardless, we're gonna have to be testing for this, and nothing's gonna get cheaper. Mm. And this is the opportunity that we have now, so we might as well test and find out where we are. Are we at the opening the window? Where are we put talking about a ventilation system? I think that we have to test and find out because we have to meet the standards. I've got one more question. Yep, go ahead, Jim. Uh, <clears throat> 400 is approximately ambient uh, CO2 levels, 400 parts per million. What's high? What's considered high? Two uh, I, have a, I can look up the statute, um, but I'm assuming Mechanical Services knows the statute yeah. and will let us know. I don't, I don't know. But I kind of like to know yeah. how much how much are we. We will find that answer. Oh yeah, during the like, like yeah during yeah. the during the committee meetings that we have uh, dealing with mechanical services, they will have the, the technical numbers and data that we can look at. As a matter of fact, I have a folder on my desk from mechanical services that I can share with you. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, is. Um, Anything else changing with the regulations aside from the carbon dioxide? Like, are there other parameters? There are. Are we testing for those as well? I think so. I think these are the only ones that they flagged. Um, oh, just the carbon they dioxide. They were in the, in the facilities meeting, um, that I think it was April. Um, they talked about um, their, as part of what we had purchased from them for HVAC, that they could test these buildings. And we said, go ahead and test the buildings. So I think that they came back and just said carbon dioxide means but they're that's testing, what we flagged. They're testing all the other um, 
parameters that we have to, to get That's my understanding. They said we will test to make sure that you can meet these new air quality okay. standards. Yeah. So I, I don't have a list of what the yeah. gases they tested yeah. for, so, but, but, it, but my guess is they would have come back and said you failed these other ones. Okay. But we will make sure about that. Mm -hmm. All right, further questions or discussion? We all set? All right, uh, all in favor? Opposed? All right. Okay, uh, staffing update. I think this is a little self-explanatory. Rather than me reading three lists, I'll let you look at it and I'll answer any questions. Wow, we tire some people. Oh, uh, yeah, Melissa, we won't be offended. It's true if you're on the screen. <laughs> okay, great. Just letting you know. It's a common thing for people who've just been hired. Like the list. So, uh, you know, while Craig is passing out the handouts, I'll provide just a little bit of narrative for those people who don't obsessively read the Press Herald like I do. Um, you may have seen there is a big story in the Press Herald on the fact that just about every district in Maine is struggling with staffing. Uh, so we are not unique in that. Uh, nor is this uh, the first time we've had uh, a number of open positions in the staffing update. Um, so, I mean, I think really the question is, are we, you know, beating every bush and shaking every tree to make sure that we are uh, getting talent? And, you know, we have reviewed the uh, search policy recently, and I do know the list of places that we uh, send out our job notices, and I have seen the quality of the uh, resumes that we get in, uh, and I feel you know, pretty confident that we're doing really what we can. Um, but I want to open it if there's any questions or concerns on this list. Very cool. Are we doing uh, push ads like on social media and stuff like that? Yeah, so we, the ads that we're using now are um, the, uh, we alternate with the uh, Lewiston Sun Journal and Portland Press Herald made Sunday Telegram. Those get a 30 day electronic ad and they push out to LinkedIn and Monster. And um, we are also now. Um, Not indeed. And indeed. And we're also now uh, investigating a system. Uh, it would cost us for a year uh, cheaper than one ad in the Portland Press Herald or Lewiston Sun Journal, where all our ads would get pushed out to 350 different uh, colleges and universities in the country that have teacher education programs. And so they would see our full ad, they would see the description, they'd see the link to our school district, and so that's pumped to those students that are getting an education degree directly. Um, and uh, we haven't purchased that service yet. There's a few I's and T's I want to cross before we do. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're doing our best to shake every tree. Do you want or I'm not sure when the deadline was, but on the program of the like learn one. The community college, yeah, there are three, uh, I believe, signed up uh, for this fall. Um, there's still time on the deadline. We still have people inquiring. Um, so we'll be able to give you a more fuller report um, 
Yeah. And just to uh, explain what that is to anybody who happens to be watching uh, or uh, is curious on the board, there we have a program that we've developed with SMCC, uh, Southern Maine Community College, uh, that Chanda uh, has he is heading up, which allows um, anybody, it doesn't have to be young people, old people, anybody who wants to uh, work in our school district, uh, especially as an ed tech, they can get essentially free schooling and get paid to work uh, while they are getting that schooling. Uh, it's an incredible opportunity to both get your education and uh, have a pretty good paycheck with great benefits waiting for you as soon as you finish the program. So if anybody's interested in that, reach out to our curriculum direct director, Chanda Turner. Does anyone know if the enrollment in the colleges and universities for teaching degrees have increased or decreased? Decreased significantly. Decreasing? Decreased okay. significantly. I'm sorry? Decreased significantly. Yeah. And yeah. have we tried to address, as the state of the Department of Education, address any of that? Well, the problem is we're producing you no know, young people. Um, our, our demographics have completely switched from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, where Schools were bursting at the seams with students, and colleges and universities were doing the same. Uh, we're at the point now where the universities are contracting. Um, last year, um, University of Maine at Farmington eliminated nine professors. The University of Maine at Machias eliminated three professors. The University of Maine at Fort Kent eliminated two, on and on and on and on. Um, and so uh, they're, they're just producing uh, fewer students that, um, part of the recruiting that I do is I always contact University of Maine at Farmington, USM, St. Joe's, and get a list of kids that are graduating with their bachelor's degree in education or people that already have a degree but have gone back to get their certificate. Uh, University of Maine at Farmington, which is the biggest, uh, second biggest producer of teachers in the state, produced 22. Um, on this list, you have bus drivers, you didn't list how many? Uh, technically, there are three vacant positions. Three. Um, and in light of what I just asked the prior question and what you had stated, that was on my mind also. Have we really uh, readjusted um, the staffing um, to a point where we really need to increase classroom sizes so we can, you know, do with less teachers? I mean, have, have we looked into doing something like that? So for the first step of the budget process in January, um, Shanda Turner, uh, Director of Curriculum and Professional Development, comes to the board, and step one is this is how many kids we have, this is how many enrolled in each school, this is how many are enrolled in each specific program, and, uh, and based on our staffing needs, this is how many teachers we need or don't need. Uh, during the course of my tenure, um, the middle school has gotten smaller, and we've eliminated several permanent positions there. Uh, a couple at the high school we have eliminated, uh, the Dunn School eliminated a couple uh, positions. So the school district, as a matter of fact, I think it was my first year here, you had to have an official reduction in force. Um, so as the school district has lost uh, about 230 students, uh, you've had a number of positions eliminated. Mm -hmm. And so that report that Shanda gives in J January uh, or early February uh, is the staffing report where you'll see exactly how many kids are being served in how many classrooms by how many teachers. Yeah, I, I think it's a new trend. And if you watch Facebook, you see how many questions are out there. You know, do you anything about this school, that school? You know, I mean, they were all over Lewis and Portland sending their children, Freeport. Mm -hmm. no, I'm sorry, am I blocking it? Okay. I apologize. Uh, so, you, you, so that being, creates a new concern that more and more people are making a decision uh, for that traditional education. So as a school board, I, I would hope that we would start addressing and looking and looking how we can reorganize um, from what we've been doing for the last 
50 years in this district that I've been here. Maybe this is something that we need to, as a, as a group, get together and talk about. Yeah, we do that every year. It would be a massive failure of us if we didn't do that, for sure. Yeah, we already did Good. We already 100%. Did that. You already did that? We already That's did that. Oh, you left me out. <laughs> we haven't done it yet. yet. Oh, we haven't done it yet. Yeah. Yeah. We do it once a year. Oh, okay. All right, good. All right. Um, appreciate the discussion on that. Um, <clears throat> I have a question. Yes. So looking at this vast list of vacancies, <clears throat> um, do we have any concerns coming into the new school year with... Um, this, I see we only have one teacher that we are missing. Most of these are ed techs and um, I don't want to say subsidiary positions, but they're not the teachers running the classroom. So do we have any concerns with teachers being sick and not having people to yes. fill those roles? Yes, that's the answer. So it makes, you know, the, the, the work doesn't go away. Right. So what happens is that those that are remaining pick up the slack. And it's one of the reasons why we got the permanent substitute positions was... In a school of any size, you know you're going to need someone to help, so you might as well have them come in every day. Um, some of these ed tech positions, uh, I'm concerned about having enough to, to, to meet our requirements there. We will hire more people in the next two weeks, um, but we will um, start the year with uh, open positions. And this is, I mean, this is a a really great place for us to be advocates for our school district is, you know, there, if you go to msad15.org um, and look at uh, the careers section, there's a link for all our open positions. If you can share that on your, you know, whatever networks that you have available to you and encourage people to work in our great school district, these are good jobs. Um, that's absolutely a great role. Go ahead, Jason. Yeah. So looking at these, you know, uh, uh, I will say it's, uh, I don't think there's too many I'm not concerned about. Uh, I think all of these are are essential and needed. Um, I am, uh, you know, definitely concerned with the number of ed tech positions. Uh, it's quite a few, and that would be, you know, students not necessarily getting the level of services that they should be getting. I think it's it behooves us to really promote that uh, community college program that we have, which would directly increase the number of ed techs that we have available within our school. Yeah. We're trying to grow our own, 100%. Go ahead, Gary. Just to piggyback on what Jason just said, um, I assume that the majority of these ed techs that are open are special ed ed techs. I would say majority, yes. So man, many of those may be positions that legally we need to, we need to supply. Yeah. Because they're more the, answering any, and, a, any child who has a need that requires, you know, if, if it's a health reason or an IEP reason that they have to have a one-on-one -on -one person, right. they get filled first. Right. I just for the yeah for the, the large number of people that are probably watching us right now, mm -hmm. so they understand that mm -hmm. a lot of these positions positions are not optional for us. Mm -hmm. They're required by law for us to provide for those students, yeah. and uh, it it it's still required by law even if we can't find them. Yeah. So, and that's why it's for, disruptive yes. because then we move. We take, you know, take one that is, is yeah, the somewhere assist, else to we, be there. We move the assistant librarian down the hall to do something. Right. But you know, if you are speaking to people in town, um, you know, I go through the cash register at the shop and save next door to the hardware store, and you know. I ask people if they need a job, and <laughs> didn't you graduate from GNG a few years ago? I actually got a really good person who had just finished their two-year degree, and, and we hired him. It's going to be great. great. But one thing, you know, people might not realize, and I get this when I sit down with people when they come to my office, and it's... Um, time to meet with the superintendent and look at the contract and sign the contract. Um, if you look at the benefits package, you know, uh, I think there are few industries and corporations that can compete with the benefits package. The quality of health insurance, dental insurance, the life insurance, sick leave, personal day, sick bank, Summers. Um, 
you know, it's, it's, there was a time in my life when I, I would have been very happy to take an ed tech job simply because of, so these are good jobs. I certainly wouldn't, uh, I, it, and people don't often know that, that if I take a, an ed tech job or an assistant job or a bus driver job or a secretary job at the school department that I'm gonna get a fantastic uh, benefits package. So that is something to, and it's right there on our website to direct people to take a look at the, uh, at the benefits package in each contract, as well as the salary scale. That was a good explanation. Yeah, both of you enjoyed it. All right, um, let's uh, continue with the agenda here. Uh, usually there's a little chair report. Uh, I don't have anything to report, but I do want to congratulate the uh, young men from the Great New Gloucester Raymond Little League for making it to the championship game of the New England uh, Little League championships, uh, many of those, all of those kids, just about, maybe a couple of the Raymond kids aren't, but almost all those kids are members of our school district, and uh, it's quite an accomplishment, so congratulations to them. Yes. All right, Craig, superintendent's report. Okay, new hires. Um, Rayanne Griffin, second shift custodian at the high school. Neil Carroll, varsity boys soccer coach. Emma McKeeshan, I'm sorry, Emma McKechnie, Library at Tech 3 at the high school. Uh, Victor uh, Gravis, second shift custodian at the Russell School. Annie Amergian, RTI at Tech 2 at the Russell School. Uh, transfers, Daniel Jenkins has transferred from a self-contained Ed Tech 3 high school to the school year substitute. Uh, Megan Hunches has transferred from Ed Tech 2 middle school to uh, a restorative ed tech three middle school. By the way, in terms of the large number of ed techs, it's because we've really encouraged our ed techs to continue their education to get a teaching degree. So over the last two years, we've had several in-house ed techs get their teaching degree, and now they're teaching for us, which leaves an ed tech vacancy, so it's sort of Problem. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's the right way to go. Right, I was going to say, that's another benefit, too. We 100% prioritize hiring from within, too. Um, all right, so uh, I'm going to ask for a motion to adjourn this business meeting so that we can open up a workshop where we can just be a little bit more casual. Uh, can I hear a motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. Second. All right, all in favor? There we go. Um, so, uh, we're going to keep the camera on because uh, we want to make sure that people see this uh, and have it recorded. I want to invite uh, Peter to come on up to the podium so that everybody can hear you. Oh, thank um, you, Gary. Let's see here. Uh, Craig, do you want to introduce Peter for everybody? Sure. Um, Peter Felmley is head of the uh, education practice group. Uh, at uh, Drummond Woodsome. Uh, he is also a co-author and editor of Maine School Law and Practices for Board Members. Uh, he's a graduate of uh, Colby and uh, University of Maine School of Law. Um, and I've worked with him in a number of ways and attended a number of workshops and uh, have called him for advice on a number of times, and uh, I've enjoyed working with him. He's uh, very helpful and thoughtful, and thought he might be uh, a good person to speak to us tonight uh, about uh, being a school board member. Yeah, and just to tack on to that, you know, we do have three completely new members, but we haven't really had a uh, you know school board legal training in least probably since the pandemic. Uh, so I thought it would be good to just get the whole hog and refresh. Uh, I do want this to be uh, somewhat informal. So, you know, if there's a question with something that Peter is saying, just raise your hand and we can, you know, kind of try to make sure that we get those questions answered. But I do want this to take no longer than an hour. Um, and so I'm just gonna ask people, right, like maybe let's not dive into some minutia. Uh, we can do some you know, research after the fact if it's like some obscure curiosity. 
But if, if you have genuine points of clarification, you know, I want this to be somewhat discussion oriented. Is that all right, Peter? That's fine by me. All right, awesome. Can well, you hear me okay? Yeah, take yeah. it away. All right, thank you. Well, thanks for having me. I am Peter Felmley from Drummond Woodsum. It's great to be here. I recognize a number of faces, but welcome to the new board members as well. Um, thanks for the kind introduction. And I did one of these last night in 30 minutes. So we could do it 30 to 60 minutes. I know we can pull Let's it off. Let's do it. So I have a handout that I'm going to pass along. I'm not going to read it to you, but you can snuggle up with it at your leisure. Um, there are some key points that I want to review with you just so that every member of the board understands what a school board is and what sort of individual responsibilities are uh, and aren't, and also what the superintendent's uh, responsibilities are that differ from yours. It's important to keep that in mind. And as your chair indicated, feel free to, this is a workshop for you. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt me. I don't love hearing my voice just carry all the time. So. Um, First, by way of clarification, um, as your outside legal counsel, we don't represent individuals for the school system. We represent the board. We represent the entity. And our goal is not to make your decisions for you, your policy decisions. You're the elected representatives of the community to make those decisions. Some of them are hard. Uh, but for the, the children and your staff and um, the citizens in the community, um, our goal, rather, is to help you understand what your options are. The, op the doors that you can walk through, the ones that have legal hair on them that'll cost you a lot of money, that will wind you up in court, uh, the ones that you can't take because they're not lawful. We're gonna highlight that for you and, and say do not walk through that door. Um, but that's our role. We're sort of a guide for you. We don't represent your superintendent. We don't represent your special education director. We don't represent teachers or principals or ed techs. Our loyalty is to the board itself. Um, and to the district. Um, tonight we're gonna focus on what that role of the board is. Uh, feel free to uh, fire away with any questions. Uh, I'm gonna compare that responsibility that you have as a board uh, with the responsibility that your superintendent has. You both have very different statutory uh, responsibilities. Important to keep that in mind to work effectively and harmoniously. Good organizations um, recognize what lanes individuals are supposed to operate within and individuals stay within those lanes. And if you do so, you run efficiently. If not, you get all clogged up. So um, first off, um, I'm on page two of the handout and I'm gonna be talking about what a school board really is. Um, school board in Maine is created by statute. And let me just back up a second. The Maine Constitution states that education is the responsibility of the state, but then it goes on to say that the state has delegated that responsibility to the towns to ensure that education is delivered. And so in the wake of that, the legislature uh, breathed life into Title 20A, which created um, the school statutes that govern the operation of public schools. So public schools are uh, creatures of statute. Your obligations are drawn, your rights and obligations are drawn from those statutes. Uh, your powers are dictated by statute, controlled by statute, derived by statute. Um, your powers as a board are um, various, but obviously you have to think about your buildings and air quality, and sometimes you have to make decisions to make changes. Uh, to ensure that those buildings are maintained. Sometimes you have to spend money, maybe on HVAC systems in order to do so. Um, in addition to maintaining your buildings, thinking about making sure you have adequate staffing um, and establishing a budget, you have to hire a superintendent. Uh, that's a core responsibility. So in that sense, you play a direct role in the hiring process. Um, also on the hiring front, school boards, uh, play a discrete role in the hiring of particular uh, individuals that work for your school system. Teachers and principals, there's a statute that says after your superintendent works through the hiring process, the selection process, interview process, um, identifies the most qualified candidate, um, brings that person to you in the form of a nomination at a public meeting and nominates a particular individual, you then have a statutory right to 
give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down. If you accept that nomination and believe that person would be an ad a good addition to your school system, then the responsibility is kicked back to the superintendent in order to extend an offer of employment. And each of those three things need to happen, the nomination, your approval, and the superintendent's offer of employment in order for the magic to happen and that hire to occur. Um, so um, with respect to student disciplinary matters, state statute makes clear that principals are largely responsible for um, disciplining students when they engage in misbehavior and violate your school rules. Um, that supervision of, of, of students is overseen by the superintendent, but there are situations, you may have encountered them, where students come before you because they've done something really bad, or it's they keep doing the same thing over and over again uh, in a student disciplinary proceeding where the superintendent believes that you need to hear about the conduct and you need to think about whether a longer term removal beyond 10 days is necessary. And in that sense, in, that, in those contexts, when you're considering maybe disciplining a student, you are sitting in a judicial capacity. You're an impartial tribunal, listening to evidence from the family, listening to evidence from the administration, reading your policies, looking at the videotape of what transpired, um, getting the facts, and then finding out whether the um, behavior at issue happened, and if it did, whether it's necessary to expel the school. So. Um, you do that privately. Some of the things that you're going to do as, as board members are done very openly. Um, and some of them are done very privately because of the sensitive nature of those uh, proceedings. We'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to the freedom of access law. Are there any questions so far? OK. So there's a long list in Title 20A, Section 1001, that lays out all the responsibilities that boards have. Um, but what I want to make sure that you all walk away from tonight's session uh, with is the, the very clear notion that your job as board members is not to operate the schools, but rather to see that they are well operated. The management of the schools, the day-to-day -day functioning, you hire people for that. You have a director of transportation, you have a superintendent, you have a director of food service, you have directors that manage each building, uh, and your superintendent has the statutory responsibility of supervising everyone beneath your superintendent. All the directors report to the superintendent. They may have subdirectors, but everyone ultimately is responsible and reports to the superintendent. Um, the way I like to think about it is, um, it's a nautical analogy, so bear with me, but um, we live in Maine, it's, the coast isn't too far away. Um, you own the boat, but your hands aren't on the wheel, right? You are responsible for establishing the course, the policy. Right now we're in, pick a town on the coast, Damariscotta. We're at a nice little dock, it's nine o'clock in the morning. By Friday of next week, we would like, as a boat company, we would like to be down in York at this other dock. We're not sure which dock yet. We're gonna rely on some expertise of the people that know all about docks and which one to, to pull up to. But what we wanna do is make sure that we can get from this point where we are to that point at this point in the future. Um, and it's on the responsibility of your captain, your pilot, the chief everything officer of the school system, your superintendent, to grab the wheel or delegate that responsibility, if he deems it appropriate, to another to grab the wheel and to actually navigate that boat um, from where you are to where you have directed them to go. Does that make sense? So the superintendent and his team are gonna be deciding whether to go around the rock on the left or on the right, whether to go through the channel, whether to do it at low or high tide, um, and um, whether to go out to, you know, to avoid um, uh, the shoals or whether to uh, go uh, much closer uh, and, and stay close to shore because of the weather. So um, now that, the, yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I mean to interrupt the boat talk, but I'm wondering if I could poke you for like a more specific example, like I have one in mind. Sure. Um, yeah. A topic that we keep hearing about 
I know one of our neighboring districts is really struggling with, and that, you know, they come up and down depending on who's, what's hot in the community, but things like what's in the library, um, what's the curriculum, like, you know, knowing the line, like one of your bullets is, um, you know, determining the general course of study, like, what is the difference between our role determining the general course of study and a board's role in doing things like, show me this, or do you have this book in the library? Really good question, and it has been a hot button issue in schools for the last couple of years now. Um, I think, I don't have your uh, book selection process and challenge processes up here. I didn't look at them in preparation for tonight. But essentially, none of you, I'm, I suspect, and I don't mean any um, disrespect if you do have um, advanced degrees in education and have masters and have taught, and, but you, you've hired experts that know how to deliver content to students so that it'll resonate, it'll reach them, and they will grow and learn. Um, you have special education directors that know the special education laws inside and out. You have curriculum directors that read reports that you haven't read. So you have experts that, uh, and, and every school has experts um, on the administrative team and on their um, payroll that are really trained specifically on making certain decisions. And my view, um, and I think the firm's view, is that, um, that as board members, without that expertise, it's important to listen and understand what the experts among you are saying. Um, that's not the only factor, right? There are other factors. And there are uh, a factor such as what individuals in town may be feeling about particular content of books. You have a policy, I haven't read it recently, but I suspect it provides an avenue for when a, fa um, a family or a group in town has a concern about a particular book in the library, that they can lodge a challenge, which will trigger a very careful review and study um, by people who will then read the book and analyze whether it has any value whether it meets the criteria that your policy very likely lays out. Uh, if your policy is consistent with policies nearby, there are probably eight or nine criteria against which materials are measured to see whether it brings any value to children generally um, and whether it should be in your school system. Now, it got into the library. So uh, in theory, it was supposed to have been measured up against that criteria, right, it, it, in a determination made. But, that determination can change. Material can become outdated. Material can be, especially in the field of science when there are advances, things can change. And so there are oftentimes challenges to materials, in which case you have a policy that allows for that review. Um, and uh, my suggestion to boards every time I've, I've been asked is for you to um, not hold your breath, because it can take a little while to, for everyone to read that material, but to sit back and wait for that review to occur. And insist that that review happens and it happens in a robust and thoughtful way. And that that review committee then come before you to explain that they read it, that they've applied the criteria that you asked them to apply, and to give you their recommendation that what is in the best interest of kids. Now you're gonna hear that. And then you're gonna hear from folks in town that may agree with them the review committee, um, that the book should remain, or that the book should uh, be removed. Now, just understand that if it comes before you, that means that the review committee has decided it should stay, and that family or the community member is not happy with that determination. So it's not going to get to you if everyone's in agreement about things being removed or um, reserved to a particular library at the high school level or at the middle school level. Um, but my suggestion, if that were to occur in your town, like it has in some others, is that you listen to the review committee, you listen to the individuals that have a concern about that, and you listen carefully. Ultimately, you have to make a decision um, uh, based on those two factors and then one other, and that's the First Amendment. The First Amendment provides that um, you're not supposed to make decisions about the content uh, of material um, based on whether you like what it says or not. You can make decisions based on, it's been a little while since I've looked at the case law on this, so it's not 
fresh, but I'll, I'll do my very best on the question. But if, if you determine that the content within the book is factually inaccurate, or it's not pedagogically appropriate, that is one reason why you can remove material. If you remove material because you don't like the message that it's sending, you run into the rights of all the students and all the staff uh, that they have, First Amendment rights, in order to access particular material. They, some in your community may want to access the material, some may not want to. So uh, long way of saying you're, you should look carefully at what your experts are saying. You should listen carefully to what people in town are saying. You should look carefully at the law. And if you need advice on what that is um, in a particular context, we're available to assist. But it's really those three factors that you're thinking about when making that decision, which admittedly can be a hard one and an emotional one. I hope I answered your question. Yes. Um, so with respect to understanding your role, um, and I'll, I'll leave the boat analogy where it was, but um, of, of not grabbing the wheel, um, understanding the impact that has if you ignore that recommendation. If you usurp the role of the superintendent or the administrator, step on their toes, step out of your lane into their lane, what impact can that have? Well, you may lose your superintendent. The superintendent may want to go to a place where that doesn't happen, where their employer is more respectful and allows them to fill the shoes that the statute expected that they would be able to fill. They may be able to spread their wings differently, better, um, in a different school system. Uh, and so that may be an impact uh, on your school system. That loss, because you're a public entity and all, the, all, all your uh, transactions happen openly, that loss will be felt and heard and seen by others. And if you become known as a school system that um, doesn't allow their superintendent to spread their wings and fulfill their responsibilities because you're constantly micromanaging, it could have an impact in your ability to attract other administrators. And so that's a real consideration, and I don't want you to lose sight of that. So important rule number one, do your level best to stay in your lane and allow the superintendent to stay um, in their lane. Um, important rule number two, the board's powers are the board's powers. They're not your individual powers. So the board acts in a collective capacity. That means you have authority as a group when you have a properly noticed meeting and a quorum of you are present. And the quorum is going to be dictated by what your policy or what your bylaws say. Um, the one exception to that, when you have authority um, potentially outside of a meeting, is when the board has delegated a particular authority to one of you. And the best example I can think of that happens about every three years is execution of a collective bargaining agreement. Because after you meet with the union at the bargaining table and you reach a tentative agreement, that tentative agreement comes to the board and you look at it and you say, you like it or you hate it. If you like it, you approve the tentative agreement and you authorize someone to execute the document that would actually bring, make the magic happen for that uh, document to have legal effect. And you don't have to designate one of your, you could designate the superintendent, you could designate any individual to sign it with your approval and authority, but oftentimes the board will designate the chair, vice chair, or some other uh, representative of the board to sign on, on the board's behalf. In which case, yes, you're not at a public meeting because that signing often occurs at the superintendent's office with the union the next day or at a, at a signing party three or four days down the line. Um, and excuse me. We never had a sign. <laughs> <laughs> I like parties. I do it. Yeah. Next time, when you when you're negotiating, next? we have the support staff contract this there, year. There so you go. I'm there already you go. See, so. June third, we'll have yeah. a signing party. Sounds great. But again, that is where one individual board member may have authority, even though they're not in the meeting. That's the exception to the rule. But that's because you've um, bestowed that 
power upon them. Um, the corollary to that is that um, individual board members don't have particular authority. So you don't have the authority to uh, walk into the building um, and to demand access to education records or personnel files because you are a member of the board. The board may have access to personnel files. Oftentimes they could be reviewed in connection with a teacher dismissal hearing in executive session, for example. And you have access to student files, but only when you're in executive session um, in a student disciplinary proceeding or some other proceeding where um, you're, you, there's a safe and confidential private space for those records to be reviewed if necessary. Um, but that doesn't entitle any one of you individually outside of that context to go to school and to rifle through individuals' files. Um, and it doesn't entitle you to uh, you know, anything really other than visitor status under your policies. You have a policy uh, laying out responsibilities for visitors to schools. Um, and schools have a, a, a real keen interest on ensuring that uh, safety and security is maintained during the day. So, uh, yes, you can make appointments. Yes, if you have a, a business reason to go, you can follow those protocols, procedures to ensure that just like everyone else, you're following those, um, those procedures. But because you're a board member, you don't have any special um, cape that allows you access to um, particular materials. Um, yes? I have a question on, um, on curriculum. Is the committee, they would have as a committee access to curriculum records or personnel records or things of that nature, whatever their job is on a committee. Would, um, they, would that be the case? The committee that's looking at uh, for a book challenge? No, 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 just in general, in general. Like, does a curriculum committee count as a meeting of the board with a quorum, even though it is not a quorum of the full board. Yes, I think is the question, right? No, uh, no, no, no. The no. The question is access to records. So, if if you're on the committee, and your job is to be on the curriculum committee, and look at records, you have the ability to be able to see the curriculum. Sure. As a group, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's, right. Because that would be a public record. That which is taught within your schools is a matter of public record and in some cases it's posted on the website in other cases it's a quick pdf email you know or a link provides access to what the curriculum is but that curriculum committee if you're on it that doesn't give you special power to access individual employment records or student no. files or thing or other confidential records right unless you have a real need to access that but the curriculum committee wouldn't the full board might in that disciplinary context or so in order to make a recommendation the committees will make a re recommendation to the full board so in order to make the recommendation you have to have the background information i sure. think that's what i'm trying to say yes and so all committees would have access to whatever they need in order to make that recommendation to the board yes okay thank you so um important rule number three we're going to talk about who you represent um, Main courts are really crystal clear on this point. You are elected by people in town. But once you're on the board, your responsibility is to the state. As I laid out earlier, you're essentially performing a state function. They've, the state has ceded that authority to the towns to create school boards, to deliver on the state's obligation to ensure that education occurs within you, the towns comprising this school system. Um, what that means is, and I want to be really clear on this, that your responsibility is to the school system and to the state. I'm going to, there's a few pieces and in, in, in points that I want to make, so hear me out fully and then I'll answer any questions. Um, that does not mean that you're not supposed to listen to people in town, okay? There's a public comment period. You need to have one, you should have one. And you should do your level best to keep people in town, your staff, your, your parents, the citizens that are taxpayers and who you have to convince you know, that you know, you're not overspending. Keep them informed about what you're doing and bend over backwards to do that. 
the more transparent you are about what you're doing, why you're doing it, the easier it is, I think, to, to bring people along and help them to understand why you're making the decisions. So listen to people in town. It is a crucial data point, and it is not the only data point, because you have statutes and regulations, federal, state laws that dictate how you as a school system must operate. And there are rules issued by the department that lay out what you must teach and how much of it you must teach and when you must teach it and how many days you must have. So hypothetically, if you had a group in town that said, we're tired of the big bills, it would be great if, and we could cut our budget in half, if we stopped educating kids 175 seat days. If we dropped it down to 80, look at the savings we could have. <laughs> right? I'm making this up, and this is way out there, okay? But this is, I'm trying to make a point. Um, that you know, even though people feel really strongly about that, for you to take that action, you'd have to vote in direct contradiction to what the state has laid out. And you would be doing that in violation of that regulation and without any authority by the department. That is a extreme risk. It's unlawful. You can't do it. So even though people want you to take that step, that's not a step that you can take. So another data point, in addition to what people want you to do, is what you're legally capable of doing. Um, another crucial data point, crucial data point, and your policies spell this out um, in no uncertain terms, is what is good for children. If you look at your packet and you turn to page seven, what your district goals and objectives are, this is policy ADA, the board, end of that first paragraph, the board will strive to ensure that the resources of the unit are directed towards meeting the educational needs of each eligible student. So you're here for them and to make sure that you're providing the best quality education. Now that theme kind of courses through your policies. There are a couple of different references to it. So my, my ultimate point is that is a, another really important data point for you to consider. So what's good for children? I'd also add what's good for your staff, too. Um, and what's good, f uh, what, what the community would like you to do, what the law allows you to do or prohibits you from doing, those are the, the, the stars, if you will, that will guide your determination. Yes? I think it's hard sitting on a board sometimes, like when we had our, the big the town meeting, we were sitting and we are having discussions and hearing the town's opinions and getting votes from the, the majority of those that were there. It's frustrating. I mean, I'm sure on both sides there's some frustration there, but when we're doing our job to ma maintain our school systems and make sure that we are meeting the needs of the students to have this group of people always voting no because it might make their taxes go up. Well, we understand that. We don't want that either. We are all tax-paying citizens. But it's hard, like, like I, in my head I want to say, why are you saying no to this when the kids need this so badly? Like, you're, I, I get that that's a doll out of your wallet, but you're also a, a tax-paying citizen as well. And it's, it's hard as a school board to hear the no's when you're like, I'm fighting for our kids and I'm on the school board and I'm doing what's best for the school system. It's just, I don't know, it just speaking outside the box here, but it's hard to not always try to convince people the good of, of the good and, and convince them of what we're doing as a whole. Um, when, you, when you get those, you just want to, why? Like, I get that everybody has their opinions and I, and I want to hear those, that's their job, that's their, that's their right as a citizen to express their opinions. Uh, but sometimes it, we don't always see, uh, maybe they didn't, maybe, maybe they didn't listen, read me minutes, um, there's a lot of things that could go into play with that too, but trying to convince people is really hard too, of what our job is here as a school board and why we do what we do and the decisions that we make. Yes. Okay. And <laughs> I, I do not have a silver bullet so, for that hard. age old problem. It's and really hard, it's right? A, it, 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 it really is. And, and I, know, it's I, hard. I credit all of you for wanting to step into this role and to give up your time and to have to 
make those hard decisions. Um, I just, I'll say two things. One, I completely understand, especially with individuals that may be on a, a fixed income, you know, what that feels like to have to be asked to pay more. Mm -hmm. And yet, I also understand your point about, you know, when you look at this in the data and the what, what is good for kids, they're we feel like there is an important expense that should be made here and, and trying to, how are we going to convince the community that this is the right thing? I, my best suggestion is to talk a lot about it and to explain and to provide data and whether it's done through superintendent reports, chair reports, whether there are presentations, graphs, charts showing um, you know, student growth uh, and the numbers, and I don't know whether they are here or not, but if they are really down here at this level and you know other schools nearby are at this level and you really see a need to invest and to make adjustments, you can you could show that data and help people to see where the money is going. And then you can repeatedly remind folks uh, as you're um, spending the money and writing those checks because oftentimes they're not written in one fell swoop. It's like periodic payments, you could provide updates about the investment that the community has made and help them understand where the monies go and you can showcase the efforts that you're making. Um, and don't lose sight of the, 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 the power that you have at a meeting like this um, to add items to your agenda to, to help bring the company, excuse me, the, the community along. Um, but that's, that's a suggestion. I guess it, it is easier to say than to do. Uh, and I'm not the one that has to do it, and uh, but I, I've seen it work effectively. And what I've just offered are are some tactics, if you will, tools that I've seen superintendents um, utilize in order to help make that work. Yes, sir. Could you 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 went over this already, but could you re? I want well maybe repeat and compare constituencies. I think there's um, a perception of constituency when you're on a school board that it's similar to your town council or other elected officials from town. And I know you talk, I mean, we are creatures of statute. I, under, I understand that. And I mm -hmm. understand who we're supposed to represent. But since we are actually on the television, could you explain a little bit about how, or how those two differ? Sure. As far, because that goes back to listening to your town. Right. Um, well, the people that elect us and who we are supposed to serve as, as contrasted to a selectman or a uh, town councilor or whatever kind of government you have. I'll do my best. Okay. And um, I'm going to get at it a couple different ways, I think. Um, so obviously you're elected by the folks in your community. Now this is a school system comprised of two communities, right? Great in Boston. And so you may be elected by voters in one town, but once you're on the board, you're responsible for running the school system, not just half of the school system as to those particular children. So if it's not appropriate, it would not be appropriate for the board to, when making decisions, make decisions only with reference to people within one town, even if that's where the majority of um, uh, weight um, of the of the board sat, and so it's important for that, as I laid out in your policy, that you're looking at the educational uh, and the learning opportunities uh, for every student that's within your school system, uh, regardless of which town they come from. Uh, and as I indicated, I think in addition to uh, the fact that you have to listen to what folks want you to hear. There are, unlike um, a town, unlike a main legislature, unlike Congress, there are very specific laws governing the operation of this complex entity. There are state and federal statutes, state and federal regulations that um, govern how your school system needs to operate, what you, what you must teach. And you can't make your decisions without reference to what those requirements are. Um, and so, and, and the state is watching. And the reports that your superintendent has to make with respect to bullying 
or with respect to uh, expenditures, the quarterly reports, the annual reports in, in a variety of different areas are proving to the state that you're doing the work that they've delegated this school board to do. You have to establish that you're complying with each of those rules and responsibilities. Now those aren't um, responsibilities that many town, small town boards have, but school boards have tremendous responsibilities for reporting to the state. So that's another sense uh, of why it differs. Um, and further, I think that the, um, the, the school board, because you're educating students and because you need to um, ensure that um, each student is given that um, real opportunity to learn, you're, you have a duty of loyalty to the students in the community, um, even if it um, means that there will be an expense that that particular group in town doesn't want to incur. Uh, and you know, one example that I, I think of is, um, you know, back in the early 1970s, uh, there was no Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. There was no IDEA, no special ed protections. That changed in the 1970s um, and built or created a, a federal civil right for students with disabilities to attend school, a really important law. And if you had a group in town that saw an opportunity to save money by not providing services to particular disabled students, you should listen to them and hear them, yes, public comment, they'll be here and they'll explain why it's hurting them financially and why you should not you know, incur these expenses. But at the end of the day, um, even though that is what they want you to do, I would be here to tell you that the federal law doesn't permit you to exclude a child or deny services, or I would tell you that if you did, this is what the cost would be. This is how many months you'd be spent in, spending in federal court and I'd tell you that at the end of the day, you would lose and you pay at least this amount of money plus the other side's attorney's fees, which can be $100,000 in, in special education cases. So shouldn't do it. It would be a violation of law. And if you did, it would cost you tremendously, which would just increase your insurance rates, which runs contrary to what the folks in town are suggesting, right? It's not a money saving uh, to, to cut and to ignore. Uh, what federal statutes uh, provide. So I guess long way of saying I believe that um, it's important to consider each one of those data points as you make your decision. Uh, and those data points are different than the data points that the town council has to consider um, because they don't have to think about um, educating students with disabilities or um, or, or providing access to um, educational opportunities for other students as well. Okay, thank you. So, excuse me, on um, state law, I've read in some of the documents I've read, we have local control. And so, um, this is making should be made, you know, can be made locally. I understand all the state laws and all the, you know, lists and everything that you explained, but there's still that factor. And that factor, if you disregard it, then that it alienates, uh, alienates the uh, public, which causes them stared up and angry because you don't listen. Also, Department of, um, um, uh, the, um, what's this group here? Oh, uh, the T Teachers Association has stated that they recognize the board as elected representatives of the people of Gray and the Gloss Domain and as the employer of teachers of MSEU schools. So in other words, they rec recognize us as representatives as well, again, including the public. And I think the emphasis that you are trying to portray here to us is that we all, I think aware, we're on the school board, we should be aware of our responsibilities and duties. We, we read all this and we know that. But there's another fact that that would keep things more uh, in line with, um, you know, what a community wants. We are certainly different than any other community. We're individuals, uh, the community, I mean. And therefore, um, I, I, I think it's, um, 
I'm trying to use a good word, but you know, the path that we're going down with, with your presentation um, almost wants to put a barrier up, and I, 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 I will always represent the public. Well, like and as a school board member, I would want them welcome here, any suggestions and all that type of stuff, recognizing the fact that you know, the main goal is to educate the students. And um, so that's um, where my emphasis would be. I, I certainly hear that. I just would like to respond. I think that um, with respect to the local control point, I do believe that the uh, if a statute dictates what a school board must do, then you don't have a lot of leeway. But there are True. many different statutes that provide schools with the choice of and, and use the permissive language that allows a school board to do something or not to do something, in which case you should listen to the people in town. And if it is a lawful course of action, um, you should consider what individuals are saying and whether that is the best course of action with the full understanding that if you don't do what people in town want you to do and it's a lawful action that you can take, that you may not have a seat on the board any longer because ultimately you are accountable to the board. But I, what I am saying to be clear is that if a member of a community or a large group in town want you to violate state law and ignore your oath and ignore what's best for students that you should think about what people are asking you to do, think about what the law requires, think about how that would impact and hurt children and make your decision based on all of that information. I know that when I joined the board I got this book all get this book mm -hmm. we yep. because I also think that as a teacher, whoever put that in the contract, it's just not true. You know, just because someone writes something in there doesn't make it the law. Um, it's actually read in here that, according to Mean Courts, the school committee acts as a public board and no sense represents the town. Its members are chosen by voters of the town, and after election, they're public officers, deriving their authority from the law and responsible to the state. So. Which isn't to say I'm not in full support of us being really active and open with the community. That's why I joined this board. I'm a parent and I love being part of this community. But I think knowing what our role is is incredibly critical to making good use of our time. I'm glad you pointed that out because I did copy that law, by the way. I did read it, copied the law, and uh, it's, it's, what, 100? I don't know how many years, it's very old. And that, that decision was made through that judge who said to the town of Yarmouth, you must educate that child. School board members, you cannot tell the town whether they can or cannot educate that child. That, that law that you just quoted is specific to that court case only. And uh, I think that that needs a clarification as well. As soon as I read it, that was the first thing I read, and I printed out the law, the court case, and I looked at the court case, and that's exactly what it is. So, I mean, if you want to, I don't want to argue. I just want to point out that fact. Of, I mean, but it's, I'll, I'll, I mean, she's, she's I'll, I'll address that, and I, I would like to move on to the superintendent's yeah. responsibilities. But I mean, I'm familiar with the case, and it was the court saying to the Arma school system that what you did wrong here mm. was you listened to what that group in town wanted you to do, and what you forgot was that there's a statute that told you how to do it. And you didn't provide that. It was essentially a removal of a student without any hearing their version of events. Essentially, no, no due process. There was a way for you to do it. You missed it. You didn't follow it. And you listened to what people were saying. You missed the critical second data point. You should have considered that before making your decision. That's what the case is. But that has to do with that court case, exactly. Yeah, that was a quote from that court case. So with respect to the superintendent's responsibilities, again, uh, laid out in statute, but um, superintendent, as I indicated earlier, is your chief everything officer who's responsible for um, you know, the day-to-day -day management of the schools, making sure that um, your policies that you've enacted are implemented and enforced. Uh, responsible for evaluating staff or ensuring that others are evaluating and supervising staff. Um, a really important um, 
player in delivering on the mission and the uh, direction and the policies that you've established. Um, the superintendent remains accountable to you. So if we go back to my nautical analogy earlier, um, if the superintendent were to go too close to the shoals or through that channel at low tide and scrape up the bottom of the boat, right? That's an opportunity for you to have a conversation with the superintendent in executive session and to um, counsel the superintendent, um, evaluate the superintendent's performance in that regard. Uh, and ultimately, as I pointed out, you have the discretion to um, select your superintendent. And so if you didn't like the, the way in which that um, course was navigated in that, um, in that boat, then you don't have to uh, remain with that superintendent. But again, really important that you allow the superintendent to fulfill his responsibilities under the statute and not uh, step on uh, those toes. Um, and because uh, it could have the impact that we talked, touched on earlier. So a couple ways that, a um, couple trouble spots for school board members. I just want to highlight these for you. Your comments on social media or email. Yes, you all have First Amendment rights. That doesn't mean that what you say in the community may not be attributed to the board and may not get a lot of egg on the board's face and may not derail your mission and may not cause um, a lot of legal expense and headaches to correct, course correct. For example, if you're a board member and you may and you have very clear non-discrimination policies that you won't um, allow discrimination or harassment uh, against any student or any employee in your school system. If you made comments online that were against those principles, against those ideas, that would force the board itself, the district, to have to step in and correct that because that's an essential um, principle that you, you real core foundational principle on which you stand. It's actually in section A, foundational principles of your, your policy book. So recognize that even though, yes, individuals have a right to say certain things, it doesn't mean if you say them there aren't real consequences and it won't force the school board to have to take a particular action to distance itself from those particular comments. Um, and it doesn't mean that the, those comments um, may not have um, uh, impact um, on you. you know, one example would be um, if you made comments about a particular staff member. Um, parent comes to you at Hannaford and says, look, the second grade math teacher was misbehaving. Um, here's what they did. Um, it's terrible. I want them fired. And if you went on social media and repeated that communication and made those comments, understand that you, you don't have the second side of the story, right? You don't have the facts. And what you've done is you've put your thumb on the scale and you've um, expressed, um, which may be untrue, um, and, and potentially damaged that individual's reputation and ability to work in the community. Um, and so that can have a real impact. If, that, if it turns out that that individual did engage in misbehavior and that the superintendent does believe that significant discipline is warranted and maybe wants to recommend termination, that would come to you. But remember what I said earlier, that when you're sitting in a judicial capacity and you're considering evidence, you have an obligation to honor the due process rights of the employees that work for you. And if one of you or multiple of you have already um, cast stones against particular individuals who later come before you, if you've prejudged the matter, you can't be an impartial tribunal. And so you may be, by making comments online um, early, you may be pulling yourself out of the running, so to speak, um, to participate in that decision. You may need to recuse yourself. You should in a scenario like that. Um, but those comments can have real impact down the line. And so be, be mindful of what you're saying um, on social media, through email, and in particular, remember um, not to, to um, chastise employees online. You, as an employer, have an obligation to uh, understand that personnel matters are supposed to be handled in a discreet 
respectful private way. State law says that. Your collective bargaining agreement has language about how things should um, be processed if there are complaints. And consequently, if you ignore that, you're upsetting the union, potentially impacting the board's liability on a due process claim. And uh, you're sending a message to staff that you may want to attract because that's going to be a bad headline. You may not be able to attract the staff that you want if you've um, demonstrated yourself to be uh, an employer or a board that uh, throws stones before they know all the facts. So be careful about that. Also be careful about, um, on the subject of communications, texts and emails, talking outside of um, you know, the, the public context. Um, you shouldn't be communicating uh, about public business um, in a private manner. You should be honoring the provisions of the freedom of access law and doing your business to the maximum extent possible in public. Uh, recognize that the definition of a public record is really broad and that doesn't, it's not limited to your school issued email account. So if you have a private email, if you have a private cell phone and you're texting about school business, understand that if there's a request for that communication, even though it is in your private account, it is something that may have to be turned over. You then have to look for it. It takes your time and effort. Um, and if, if you uh, are not mindful of what you're putting into that communication because you think it's private, you may say more than you wish you had said, and you may be embarrassed by what comes out. So be, be mindful of that. And my tip is to use your school-issued email only, uh, and because that makes it a lot easier for the central office, the tech director, to pull those emails in response to a freedom of access request, which minimizes the costs associated with that request and minimizes the amount that individuals asking for records have to pay. Did you have a question, Superintendent King? No. Okay. Any questions on that freedom of access? We only have you know, five, ten minutes here with Peter. That I really just don't want anybody to get caught unawares by that. We have had freedom of access requests before, and people are surprised. Like, what do you mean my private email? Or what do you mean my texts? If you are discussing school business, it is the public's right to know. Just want to make that clear. In the couple of minutes I have left, um, I'm not going to review the, each of the policies. Um, in the packet, but I want to highlight for you um, that I've, I've attached your own policies. I encourage you to read these particular elements. I think that they um, do help to shed light on what your responsibilities are as individual board members, uh, your code of ethics, for example. Um, but I'd also just remind you that um, in, in, I included policy ADAA. That's the school system commitment to standards for ethical and responsible behavior. I'm not gonna read it to you, but essentially it says that you expect that adults interacting with students on your campus will behave in a particular way. And your policy section G talks about what you expect your staff, to, how, they, how you expect them to engage with others on your school campus. Your policy section J or I talks about what you expect of your students in the student code of conduct. Um, and you've made certain pronouncements to people in your community about what your expectations of behavior are. If you're not living up to them yourselves, you're not sending the right message to the people that you know, work and learn in, in your school buildings. So I'd encourage you to understand what you're asking others to live up to and do your level best to live up to those same principles yourself. Yeah, and I think that is something um, that took me a little while on the board to really uh, understand was that we have so many policies and they say so many things and there are times when we are out of alignment with our policy for lots of reasons, because we didn't have time or because we didn't know that was in the policy because we haven't reviewed it since 2012 or whatever it is. We want, like, we want to identify those areas and correct them, right? It's not a disaster if we were not operating by the policy. 
But if we find that we are not operating by the policy, we need to correct that as quickly as we can. It's we don't want to hide it or you know pretend it didn't happen. We want to say, hey, we've been operating this way because it was convenient and we didn't realize that policy ADA says we need to do X, Y, and Z. We'll change that, right? And absolutely, I want all of us to have a really good facility and understanding of the policies that we have. We're not hiding anything, but we do make mistakes and we are human. Uh, I want us to have you know grace for that, and when we recognize that we're doing something wrong, we just correct it and move forward, um, and you know try to make sure there's no harm done. Or on the flip side, we have a policy we haven't reviewed in ten years that may be outdated, and those right, we, have, we have policies that need to be corrected because it doesn't fit with the time or the new guidelines or the new laws. Mm -hmm. So we have to change them for the better. All right, any other questions for Peter? Because I do want to move into one more piece of the workshop, and uh, we are right about at that hour deadline that I uh, provided. Any other thoughts? Um, you know, John and Woodson are available to us. Um, you know, it might be something that we think about uh, as a board for a little while. If we want a specific training on a specific thing, we could have Peter come back and do a half an hour on Sunshine Law or whatever it happens to be you know, that we really want to deep dive into it if we feel like it was a little bit too cursory today. So this isn't the only time that we can get training. Um, and what I think is it's just a reminder, you know, whenever I get one of these trainings, I immediately am taking notes about all the things that I've never looked into before. So, um, you know, be thinking about that. And if you find there are things that you don't understand and we want legal advice on, you know, sometimes we just ask Craig, but that's the sort of thing, like, let's make sure everybody else knows too, so that we, you know, we all gain by that knowledge. If I, if I can make a pitch for the Maine uh, School Management Association October workshop, uh, there's probably 25 sessions like this by Drummond Woodson and several other law firms that do education law um, on all manner of topics. What's new in the legislature, what's new in collective bargaining, what's new um, IDEA. Uh, so, you know, if you're a, uh, a school board member, we do have um, uh, professional development funds for you to attend the uh, annual uh, conference. And, um, you know, you could spend the whole day listening to these kinds of presentations. All right, well, uh, hearty thanks to you, Peter. We really appreciate your time. Well, and, thank you uh, for having me, and thank you sincerely for all that you're doing for your communities and your service to the community and the kids in, in town. Thanks. Thank all right, so thanks, I'm Peter. going to, yet again, uh, put a close to this part of the workshop, give people an opportunity for a three-minute bio break, and then we have one more piece of workshop business. I don't really, this is gonna be a little bit more personal about learning about each other. So Josh, uh, if you want to uh, cut off the feed, those were the two big pieces I want to make sure we had recordings on. And uh, this last part, I'm gonna to try to keep it a little bit lighter. Um, and uh, we'll be right back.